Thank you. Hello. How's our mics working? Oh, I'm so glad to hear. We've learned so much from last year. No, welcome to our conversation tonight. I'm John Hendricks. Thank you for that generous introduction. Um, thank you to our panel for being here for this conversation. Um, so Sho, Mako, and Sarah, they're all brilliant artists. They're also all incredibly gifted writers. And through brush and pigment, um, pianos, op-eds, hymns, beat dropping, essays, they all actually, despite that variety of medium and form, they actually all share a lot of content. Um, despite that vast variety, they love Jesus. And that actually unifies a lot of their themes and a lot of what they like to talk about. So I hope we can have a wide-ranging discussion tonight uh, that will enliven uh, your view of what the arts are in the church. We're not going to be too in the weeds. We're not going to be talking hardcore uh, pigments and <laughs> microphone stands. Although I, I, we could, I guess. I, I could go on and on oh. yeah. <laughs> about microphone hard. stands. <laughs> but I want to start with a pretty big question. Um, so why are you guys artists? I mean, last year we had Tim Keller. Like, Tim Keller is saving souls, so I, <laughs> I don't know what you guys are doing, but... Uh, yeah. praise, praise God you brought the real ministers today. That's right. Um. <laughs> yeah, so why art, of all the things you could do? What do you, you've dedicated your life to this, so why? Well, for me, um, I grew up in a household where you had to compete to get attention, so I figured uh, you have to use your imagination a lot, and... Uh, along with using my imagination on how to, you know, out communicate for other obnoxious kids. <laughs> um, my parents impressed on us at a young age, just creatives. Like, I mean, I was in, I remember being like in elementary school, my parents giving me individuals to write reports on like Langston Hughes and Claude McKay and Zora Neale Hurston. And, I'm like, can I just write about MC Hammer, please? Can I like? <laughs> and so that just created an indelible impact for me. And mm -hmm. so those individuals stuck with me. I actually started off as a poet, as a, as a writing poems. And then <laughs> around junior high, high school, I realized that all the girls like hip hop rap artists. So I was like, <laughs> well, clearly I'm making yeah. a career change. That's, yeah. a, <laughs> that's right. So. Yeah, your answer is basically mine, which is I just wanted, you know, <laughs> praise, basically. Yeah, right. Pretty much, yeah. pretty much. <laughs> Sarah, what, what about you? Uh, I was very um, internal, and I needed a way, or this was the way, so that I, the, the release valve for me was always writing music um, back from a very young age. And so um, I was compelled to try to communicate and put together ideas and the things I would see and experience in a way that um, I, I love naming things. That's maybe my favorite part of what I'm doing is mm -hmm. trying, to, trying to understand a certain emotion I've just lived through or something my friend has just experienced. What's the difference between what just happened there? Why did you say that? And why did you, why, we, those, that was the same thing. We're both looking at the same thing, having these different reactions. So I was fascinated with that and wanted to name what was happening in kind of in the internal world. And so um, that's what definitely, I, I just was trying to name my own stuff. And then I married a, an activator husband, an eight on the Enneagram. <laughs> oh. And uh, he just felt like I, I, it was like giving a cat a bath, but he thought, I think this stuff could be valuable to other people. And so he was really a, a mm -hmm. instrumental part of my being an actual artist. If you're talking big V vocation, yeah. yeah. If you're playing Carver Project Bingo out there, you can color in Enneagram. <laughs> Sorry. I should, we should have thought of that, actually. Excellent. Ma That's a Mago, great how idea. About, how about you? Why, why, why are you a painter? Why do you do your work? So everybody is, is an artist until third grade. Yeah. Right? So at that point, somebody says, you know, you're, you're not good enough or whatever, right? Uh, um, you remain an artist because you're kind of stubborn about it, or maybe, maybe you, it is the only thing you, you, you can do. And um, you know, by the time you know, high school and college, and um, you know, I have um, people 
sometimes will bring their portfolio and say, you know, and, and their question is, am I good enough to be an artist, right? And my uh, cruel answer is, if you have to ask that question, you're, you, you can't be an artist. Mm -hmm. It's just too hard. Mm -hmm. Like, it, it has to be like the only thing that you, 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 uh, you feel you're, you're called to do, or, um, you know, you just have to do it no matter what people say. You know, and I, I, um, I, I was very fortunate, though, that I have parents who, understood my gift, and they, both of them, um, um, were very encouraging to me. So, you know, I, I think that was definitely part of it. But, but really this internal compass that drives you to make art, um, mm -hmm. that, that really has to be uh, the, the place you draw from when, you know, everybody's, uh, misunderstanding you or your art or, you know, the church says, you know, this and that, and the world says this and that, and you're like, well, I'm, I'm still an artist, you know, I still believe in what God has called me to do. Yeah, it's a kind of like, you, you almost don't have any other thing you can do, like yeah, if, yeah, exactly. I'm going to do this anyway, right? right? Exactly. Yeah. yeah. And it, it is hard, and you, you all are, are faithful believers. Can you, can you talk about your experiences of being an artist in the church, I mean, there's there's a hardness that goes with that some, sometimes too. What? Yeah. Oh, we just got to continue to do like that because <laughs> I don't care. Okay. No, I don't. I'll you, do it. I'm no, just, no, no, no. You don't need to. Do that. Okay. <laughs> I said at these events, I'm usually quoting Mako, so I don't know exactly what to say. I would go to a, an I'm idea. I'm just going to quote that... Sarah. <laughs> Here, wait, 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 wait. So on my you... third question. Sarah, on a video on your site, you name check Mako by pushing back against the idea of art's role being pragmatic, yes. pragmatic and utilitarian only. Yeah. And, yes. I, and I, I, I think that's something that maybe you don't think about unless you're an artist and people are always asking you what you can do for yes. someone, yeah. right? And I couldn't figure out what was bothering me. I couldn't figure out why my relationship with the church was hard and mm. why... Mm. Um, why I felt like I had this whole life and yet I felt the way that I was asked to engage was, was in this mm -hmm. one way of utility until mm -hmm. I read uh, utility and pragmatism have infected every institution, maybe primarily the church. Mm -hmm. And so if something, if, if useful equals good, right. what do you do with all the unuseful people? What do you mm -hmm. do with all the unuseful mm -hmm. thoughts, the unuseful well, art? The, 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 or you the intentional unuseful people. Yes. <laughs> intentionally unuseful. Yes. Yes. <laughs> intentionally unpurpose driven people. Yeah. Yes. Right. Yeah. So that, he, <laughs> he helped me name something yeah. in, that was happening in my life that um, then made me feel more okay in my own skin of like, I'm going to uh, do some stuff that, that won't have this pragmatic usefulness or utility to, to you maybe, but um, that I just need to go get the crayons back and start playing and, and doing that kind of thing. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. Well, I mean, do you mind sharing your experience? You said that you went to Mako's I Am conference and that was very helpful for you because mm -hmm. you were in that spot of not, like, knowing where your, your place was in making art and could you still, could you still do this? Yeah, I, um, I, I knew that, I, you know, I grew up outside Los Angeles, so I kind of knew that at a young age, as I kind of told you how I was cultivated, I knew I wanted to evolve around entertainment in some way. Um, but the church had no idea what to do with me. <laughs> and so every discipleship program or every mentoring or any kind of D group or college ministry I'd been through, they were trying to make me a pastor. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Um, because you like to talk loud or you like to, you know, right. And like, I want to be a great communicator, but I don't want to be didactic. I don't want to, yeah. like, you know, be Tony Evans. But um, they, that's how they were cultivating me. Yeah. Like, yeah. it seemed like every kind of spiritual formation was, yeah. was equipping me to be hmm. a pastor or a missionary. Yeah. And by default, I just felt like art was, um, was JV. It was, hmm. it, was, it was second tier. And so for me, it was... I literally thought about going on full time as a as a campus minister. Literally. And so I started raising support and then I realized like, no, this is not for me. I can't raise support. <laughs> and so 
<laughs> and so I, uh, and so I took a took a risk, and I went to actually went to film school, and uh, decided I'm I got to figure out how to make it in the mainstream market because that's another way that people were feeling. It's like there was no intentional equipping of me on how to exist in a market that wasn't that wasn't um, pro faith. Like what, right. do, what do I, you know, right. how do I maneuver in excellence? And so, you know, for those people who may know my history, I just decided to make music for, you know, a particular group of people. And once I got to a place where I was like, I just don't know if this is who I am. Like, I don't know right. if the, all of the identity and all of the, the formation, the culture, the cultural formation has made me to be the next Toby Mac. You know what I'm saying? Right. right. And so I was at, a, I was in a, Point of crisis. I literally was questioning everything. Mm -hmm. I was questioning the people I was reading, the church institutions I was a part of, and I had a friend who was in a similar space, but he was um, uh, a nonprofit leader, not an artist at all, but he knew about the I Am Conference, which Mako uh, held for, for five years. And so he was like, just come. And I went, and it was the most liberating experience I, like, I had had to that point in my life where I had, you know, I heard from people who had worked in, you know, in Disney, uh, other artists, I heard Mako speak, and it was just mind-blowing to see people who believed in creating art for art for the beauty of it, and uh, like removing this utility for Christian mission, Yeah. right? right. And so, um, though it can still have great impact and it can still be used for mission, obviously, but that's not the end, like we don't create it, that's, you know, for that exact purpose, right? And so. Um, I walked away that week. I also got a chance to see uh, Max McLean do uh, screw tape letters on off Broadway, and I remember sitting in the audience. And afterwards, <laughs> he did a Q and A with the audience, and he asked a couple questions. He said, "How many people in this room actually believe in the God of C.S. Lewis?" Uh, and there was literally maybe thirty percent of the crowd raised their hand. And so that made another indelible impression. It's like, <laughs> this man is performing work that was written 60, 70 years ago to an audience that is predominantly ag agnostic and atheist, and people are engaging in this deep spiritual work. Yeah. Like, mm -hmm. that's beautiful to me. Yeah. yeah. And so I was like, I'm doing it all wrong. <laughs> so, <laughs> and so that, that just kind of changed the way that I, I saw it. It just made me more, um, and in some ways it made me an antagonist to the church. And I wish as I, I can go back, I can think of how to, hmm. to repurpose my language. Because hmm. I was very uh, vitriolic with some of the things that I was saying about the church at the time. But um, it made me real, it made me push people to, to certain philosophies and ideas that I think are more beneficial now. Mm -hmm. um, even to the point where I realized well, if there's not going to be any intentional training and equipping of artists, then maybe that needs to be my calling as well. Mm -hmm. Right. Well, actually, that's a really good follow-up. I think, Mako, you write so well about this uh, in your book, Culture Care, where you suggest, you know, that th we're not trying to win territory. Um, and I, I think, what, what is it that the American church misunderstands about mm -hmm. art in this way? Like, so, first of all, I want to acknowledge my colleagues who ran the IM conference, um, like Brian. Yeah, we figured out all three of us yeah, were at that yeah, conference. Yeah, and Brian Hovath, uh, Joyce Lee, May, Megan Ritchie, all, all these people made it happen. And uh, um, as I look back, it was, it was kind of a miraculous intervention because, uh, you know, we, we all felt like we couldn't do this thing. And, and, but felt also compelled that it has to be done because there was no other place to have this conversation. So we had people like Nigel Goodland and Steve Turner uh, from UK, Jeremy Begbie, and um, all, these, all these people who uh, supported us by being there. And um, it was a profound experience for all of us. Um, you know, this idea of the role of the arts in the church um, I used to think, you know, I, I'm uh, naturally an arts advocate. I'm going to defend artists and make space for them, safe, safe space for the, the, them to hopefully thrive. Um, and then I had this revelation while I was writing my first book um, that, you know, this is, this is not just about the arts and the artists. This is about the gospel. Yeah. Mm. So yeah. that's why I'm so passionate about it. I, that's why it, that, that thought brings me out 
into a place like this. I, I, I'd much rather be in the studio. <laughs> but, um, you know, my next book is called Theology of Making. It starts out with identifying this broader um, context for how the utilitarian pragmatism took over the church. And part of, you know, when you start in Genesis and you see that God created, right? That's, that's the first thing that you see about God. So this God, who is an artist, um, created, um, but he, God is all sufficient, right? God is self sufficient, all sufficient, all powerful, all knowing. There was no need for God to create. There was no like purpose me mechanics that would cause God to say, "Oh, I'm going to create because I have to because it's you know it's industrial reality of who I." Am. No, there was none of that, right? But we have made the church into this mechanical Darwinian reality, you know, that we have to survive somehow in this Darwinian, you know, battle, culture wars, and we have to position ourselves as conservatives so we can win the battle of culture wars. All of that is coming out of the scarcity mindset, which is not biblical. It's just not simply biblical. And, and the, the, behind that is this idol that we operate in, which is that, oh, God needs us to fix the world. <laughs> God needs for us to defend God, to debate his, God's existence, and win that debate mm -hmm. when God doesn't need defending. Mm -hmm. God doesn't need us. Mm -hmm. God doesn't need creation. So why did God create? God created because God is love. Mm -hmm. And love is gratuitous. Mm -hmm. Love is extravagant. Love is unexplainable. Love, love cannot be contained yeah. in, in a church program. You know, love has to be received. And Jesus came to give us the ultimate sacrificial agape love that kick-started for all of us to understand that we are in this because of grace. Mm -hmm. Not because we can fix the world, not because we can win the cultural world battles, not because we can defend the gospel. Mm. Coming from that perspective, God being an artist, God doesn't need any of this, then you come to a point where you say, well, which is at the heart of God's message? Is it this reality of us Christians doing our work so well that, you know, we can fix the world, we can win the cultural war battles, we can... Mm -hmm. Or is it, you know... So, in a sense, is God creating a machine that keeps churning out results for God? Or is it more like God playing hide-and-seek and playing with us mm -hmm. as his children? and loving us despite our foibles and brokenness and, you know, mess that we create. Yeah. You know, Sarah, you talk about in, in like, creating those extravagant, um, wasteful spaces. And I, I'd love to hear you talk about Art House North a little bit and, mm -hmm. and maybe how that is a, I don't want to say practical, yeah. but it is like a lived out way of, of doing something. It's highly impractical. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> Good. Oh, excellent. It's been, uh, yeah, activated really by the writings of Mako and then Charlie Peacock, who founded the Art House in Nashville and invited us to ignite the kingdom imagination in our communities by being human, by, mm -hmm. by just exploring what it means to be human. And um, I think one of my favorite things about Art House, we, we needed to step away from anything that was really program driven or uh, there's no, there will be no expansion. The Art House is a small, um, it's, we bought uh, this old church, and it seats 120, 140 people. It will never be bigger than that. So, um, so we needed space where we could kind of uh, have this kind of dialogue and um, in our community and invite people to think about what the reconciliation of all things are, this sort of uh, that God is um, inviting us to play, and, and what, would that, what does that look like? Um, 
and to not have this sort of, Charlie said at the beginning, we will never do an event that's sort of secretly this or secretly that. We were, we were just not going to have this, you know, sort of second speak where we're like, and then on Friday night, bring your friends because that's when we're really going to, you know, do the thing. Um, yeah. But that we were just going to do what we were going to yeah. do it. If, if we were, um, Charlie yeah. told me the story of, of the cellist of Sarajevo um, mm -hmm. when I was really mm -hmm. questioning my role as an artist working with words. Mm -hmm. And here's a man who goes into a bomb crater and plays a cello. And um, the media attention, some people believe, hastened the end of the war. And what does it mean then, a, a generative person, as Mako then writes about, is a person who doesn't just stand around the rim of this bombed out crater, um, but cr crawls down in it and starts, you know, like lip being, doing the thing. And so instead of just, it's easy to kind of talk about it and have all these sort of but to actually engage in that. So, um, so this is our attempt to do that, and it ends up looking like a, a square dance. We have a neighbor who's a, a banjo player, and so we have a neighborhood square dance. It's all kinds of things of us just trying to, um, or writing a musical, or you know, creating the different pieces that these guys are mm -hmm. participating in. Well, I, I want to, um, I, I think, challenge some of your, um, th this is where I really lay the hammer down. Okay. This is, <laughs> so we've, I think we've laid out an interesting case that art is, is useless, basically. It's, it's valuable, <laughs> it's valuable, but not, or it is being applied or asked to do work that maybe it shouldn't do in some way, right? I, I, I feel that tension a lot. We never somehow ask the, the plumber to do free plumbing in the church, but, yeah. you know, we, we get asked to do banners or whatever. Um, yeah. <laughs> but I, I do think there is a, a reason that people make art, and I think St. Louis has been, has been changed forever with the events in Ferguson in 2014, mm. and there is a kind of need, I see it in young people that I teach, to want to speak into these areas. They want to make a difference. Uh, and show, obviously, on your album, I mean, the narrative one and two, you really challenge the church to think critically about uh, injustice, racism, police brutality. So I, do, I guess what I'm saying is, does art need to engage these important themes to be relevant? Like, does it need to do something? You know, why not write a song about a beautiful flower, right? Like, you, you're actually, you are trying to do something, mm -hmm. right? Yeah. Because that's in... Uh... I would say that's just in my DNA. Um, actually, I think from the, from the books, you mentioned Steve Turner. Steve Turner quotes T. Boone Burnett, T. Bone Burnett, mm -hmm. and, and the, it just, this quote has stuck with me. He said, you can either write songs uh, about the sun, or you can write songs about what the sun helps you see. Mm -hmm. And I think for me, I do both. I write songs about the sun, Jesus, mm -hmm. and I write songs about what mm -hmm. the sun, Jesus, helps me see. Mm -hmm. And sometimes I may write songs about a flower, and mm -hmm. yeah. Then I may write songs about injustice and political um, polarization. I don't think either song is more, um, should be more provocative than the other. Mm -hmm. I mean, I should provoke you. When I'm writing about the flower, I should provoke you in a way to, to think deeply about God's goodness and his grace and, and his creation. Um, in the same sense, when I write about political polarization, it should prov provoke you about his creation, his grace, his goodness, mm -hmm. and how people manipulate creation right, mm -hmm. and for their own benefit. So it's just really about how do, we, how do we form the approach about what we're writing about, and hopefully the end, um, it's leading you to, the artist is being authentic of who they are and the truth, and um, it's leading you to think deeply about something. But I think oftentimes what's happened is the artist has tried to cheat with the, like cheat, and jump ahead of the, put the cart before the horse in a sense. Mm -hmm. And that's why a lot of Christian art felt, feels forced mm -hmm. and not authentic and... Uh, right, like the church wants the art to do a certain thing, but the artist wants it to do a different thing. Yeah, and some artists, not all, yeah. Because it. it's, it's, sometimes it's very beneficial to, to do the opposite, to just, mm -hmm. well, these folks want this, well, let me give it to them. And we've seen that in mainstream circles, and it's not just mainstream artists, Christian artists do the same thing. So, I don't yeah. know if that was the question you asked, but I gave it to you, sir. No, that's great. <laughs> Buy my I, album. I mean, <laughs> the narrative on sale now. <laughs> uh, Mago, you, you write in Culture Care about um, it is critical that we connect beauty to justice. Mm -hmm. Now, that, that is a fascinating idea. Now, yeah. what, what, what do you mean by that? I mean, practically, what, what does that look like? So, uh, Dr. Elaine Scarry at Harvard, who uh, teaches graduate seminar um, on literature, 
um, has a book, beautiful book called Beauty and Being Just, um, which um, I refer to a lot, and that, that connection is made uh, from that book. And she talks about the word fairness. Uh, when we say something is fair, that means, you know, ju just, but it also means beautiful. And so, you know, when you think about that, um, so can an experience of beauty bring us to long for justice or have a way of addressing um, injustice in, in a way that, you know, as an antidote to the fractured reality, you know, traumatized reality? And the answer is absolutely yes, but how to do it you, you, you're not going to be able to, you know, have a uh, three-point three sermon that is going to effectively tie this link. You, you have to have a song. You know, I was um, at a gathering where uh, civil rights, um, uh, Reverend Jackson was there, um, and I was just like in this panel, he was sitting across, and um, he, he, we were talking about uh, Dr. King's um, you know, journey, and um, there were about 30 people in the room, and uh, the organizer was very disappointed uh, because it was raining, and you know, he invited 100 people to come. Uh, Jesse Jackson came and you know, spoke, and, but there was only 30, 30 people, and, and, and so he apologized to Jesse Jackson, and, and um, and Jesse Jackson said, well, a lot of times when Marvin was speaking, there was only like 20 people. Yeah. It was only when Marvin Gaye started you know, mm. writing songs mm. that mm. civil rights became civil rights. Mm. And he looked right at me and he said, that's why we need artists. Mm. Mm. Mm -hmm. <laughs> and and I, 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 I never forgotten that because I, I think that there's, you know, it, there, there, is a, there is purpose. You know, I, I don't mean to suggest that God is creating this chaos or purposeless reality. I'm just saying that we should place in the center at the heart of our conversation, especially if we're talking about the gospel, this extravagant, gratuitous beauty of love that God is exuding. You know, the Holy Spirit doesn't read labels, <laughs> you know, so I'm convinced that um, a lot of what we think uh, are churchy activities may not be as spirit-filled, mm. <laughs> mm -hmm. but in fact, people taking risks in the margins, creating language um, that, you know, and they, they may not even be Christians, they may be speaking in ways that show their longing for fairness or love. And the Holy Spirit's like, oh, that's where I'm going to be, you know? <laughs> this church meeting is kind of boring, you know? That, these, yeah. these people are really wrestling with <laughs> truth, you know? <laughs> and I, I, I can kind of picture this, you know, funny inversion in, in the world. And right. artists kind of know this, you know, they, they tap into that, you right. know, in their songs and their art and, you know. Yeah, I, I just <laughs> wonder about, we had a very high flute and title, you know, can art, you know, be a, a healer to the, the divided church? We really just said that to get you in here. Uh, <laughs> but I think it, we, maybe we expect too much of art. Should art really be soothing us? Should, should it be disrupting us? Like, what, you know, when you make something, are you, are you setting out to heal broken wounds? I mean, that seems pretty prideful, right? Well, well I mean, again, again, if you bring it back to purposefulness of art, then you miss the point. Right. Right? Like, like I, I'm not, I'm, I'm mirroring God's gratuity in my work, and, and therefore, I, I, don't, I don't need to do that, right? I'm freed to make art because of my love for the materials, um, being able to be present in the pain and joys of life, uh, to be able to express honestly what, mm -hmm. what really is happening rather than e even what I don't even understand, my intuition can catch and express because of my training, right? So I, I, don't, I don't have to, um, in a sense, <laughs> cre create a purpose or defend myself, mm -hmm. you know? And I, 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 don't, I don't, because that, that's, that's when I realize, wow, God is really an artist. 
Because when I do that, when I step out in faith, and when I simply be who I am in the studio, um, God shows up. Mm-hmm. And, and it has all sorts of things that happens around that that makes me believe that, you know, the Holy Spirit is like, you know, it's, it's, it's really encouraging me to just be yourself. Don't, mm-hmm. don't play a role that you think mm-hmm. the church wants you to play. Or just be yourself. Mm-hmm. And I think art can um, kind of trick you to seeing through other people's eyes, too, or, or it allows you to enter other experiences. Uh, you know, Sarah, on your new, most recent studio album, mm-hmm. Floodplain, um, you have this, yeah. the, the title track is so beautiful, um, but the, the refrain is, is, some hearts are built on a floodplain. Uh, and I, to me, that, re- that allowed me to see um, a lot of issues through that lens. I don't know, can you talk about what that song meant and how, what, what did you mean when you were thinking of that? Uh, I was on the floodplain when I wrote that song and was, um, I had a hiatus between uh, Invisible Empires, was the, the previous record, and a good four or five years had passed. And I just couldn't see myself in the future. I was, having, I was in a, a very deep depression. And um, I was invited by some friends who had, they had free studio time and they just said, let's go, they called it band camp. Let's go just remember what we love about this. And uh, so we just went to play, but they invited me to, they kind of made it like it was gonna be even Steven, like we'll, we'll co-write some stuff. Well, when, when I got there, we were just working on my music and the whole, it was, it was sort of an <laughs> intervention for me. <laughs> I didn't know it, but I, you know, we're two days into just really working hard on my music, and I'm like, what are you guys getting out of this? And they kind of gathered around me in that way, like, well, we just saw you or couldn't see yourself, and we wanted to, you know, speak into that. What a beautiful gift. And to ask, invite you to play. So we were just out creating this record, but, sorry, to, I got off the floodplain, but to me, I was, I had gone and done a tour, so I'm in this deep depression. I did a tour of St. Paul, and learned that the immigrant communities would build on the floodplain. Uh, it was the land that was available, and so right. under the high bridge, there was an a, a Italian community there, but the water would rise every year, and everything they'd gained would be washed away. Mm. And there was a story about uh, Mama Mancini, who started Mancini, Mancini's restaurant, that she had lost a child in one of these floods, and had started making spaghetti to get up the bluff, you know, get on higher ground. And so um, I was on uh, running along the floodplain, which is a very special place to me, a place where I commune with God. It's, it's just such a, a verdant space in every sense of the, of the word green. And um, I was running to try to get endorphins going, trying to reverse this place I was in. And I had come from a very bootstraps theology, place of bootstraps theology. You know, just I was tugging so hard. Mm-hmm. And, um, mm-hmm. And so as I ran, I, I saw, I was thinking about this story, and I thought, you know, what's the spiritual equivalent of making spaghetti? I need to make more spaghetti, whatever that means, <laughs> to like move up the bluff, you know, and yeah. um, is that positive thinking. And I just felt a very strong sense, like, I don't think that positive thinking is the gospel that saves me. Mm. Um, and I began uh, thinking at the, the top of the bluff is the James J. Hill house, and that's a symbol of power, and of he was a railroad baron, and um, and so here you have this group that's everything's being washed away and then this security. And I just felt that word in my spirit that um, some hearts are built on a floodplain and that, first of all, I've got folks all over that that's not identity in Christ. I've got folks that live on a bluff and I've got folks that are often in the water and really struggle with extra rocks in their backpack. So, but, but to me, it was symbolic of anyone where someone on a bluff is looking down at anyone and saying, just pull harder, you know, mm. that that was trying to give language to that space and that place. I didn't want to write a record about depression, but I had to be true to what was happening in me. And I think that you asked about this justice thing. I've really wrestled with that kind of music as propaganda or, you know, you're trying to like sell some kind of idea. But I think I've just tried to really faithfully bear witness to every space that I'm in. And like David, his license seems to be to walk in and either say, fall on my knees and who have I in heaven but you? There's nothing I desire more than you. Or to walk in the room and say, the wicked look pretty happy to me all day long. Mm -hmm. They go to their jobs, they seem to be doing just fine. I wash my hands all day Mm -hmm. and all I get is a punch in the stomach. Mm -hmm. So he's called to -hmm. to tell the truth about what he sees. Mm -hmm. Um, Mm -hmm. And uh, there's there's no sort, doesn't seem to be a sense of what faithful reflection on that would look like, you know? Right. Well, I, 
I think that how, how we use art or how art ministers to us is in a way like, you know, it's, a, it's another side of usefulness or it's, um, I mean, I think for your work show, like your, your work, your album, most recent album is really meant to, at least for me, just speaking personally, it's allowed me to see through your eyes and, and inhabit some of that space in some way. It, the, I, I'm going to quote the Washington Post about you, so look out. <laughs> he, he believes his own culture, one shaped by a love for hip-hop and pride in his ethnic heritage, is often at odds with a Christianity that's dominated by white uh, political conservative politics. And, and I mean, how, what would you like to say to me? Like, how is, what's a way that I can respond to you um, that, would, that would be real? Like, what would you want to say to someone that doesn't understand that viewpoint? Um, well, one, I said the first step is just patronize it, you know? I think mm. that is the first part. It's the obstacle of even patronizing. It's, you know, it's funny. Uh, we were talking about Hamilton. Mm -hmm. Hamilton is like, it's been somewhat of like the gateway drug for folks to get into hip hop, right? <laughs> yeah, it's true. I guess so. <laughs> Some folks never knew hip hop was a thing until <laughs> Hamilton. Mm -hmm. And so, but it's, you know, and for some folks that, that's, a, that's a tension because they're like, man, yeah, Hamilton, eh, they won't, you know, your it's purists like will say like, oh, that's <laughs> just, but I, I, I find it a wonderful uh, thing because now it's created more opportunity for other art to come behind it. Mm -hmm. um, other theater to, to do similarly and have greater success and maybe it be, dare I say, more authentically attached to the, the, the true essence and culture of hip hop, if that makes sense. Mm -hmm. um, and I respect him and I love it, um, but I would say just patronize it. And then also recognize it for, for what it is. It's, it's the cultural expression of people who are, who have who come from oppressed and marginalized communities. Mm -hmm. And there are gonna be some things said that you, you don't connect with and you don't reflect on, right? Mm -hmm. Or that you don't often reflect on. And so, um, I've been personally diving deeply into spirituals recently. Mm -hmm. And one of the things, I deeply, I truly believe that hip hop is just a progeny of kind of like spirituals. And when we think about spirituals and we think about hip hop music, it is, it's deeply tied to justice. It's very creation. It's, it's inception was birthed in the New York streets because of the plight and the blightedness of its community. Think about most of black art in itself has been created in that same, mm -hmm. in that same kind of like Petri dish of mm -hmm. like, we're gonna take the best of the raw materials that we have and we're gonna create something that expresses all of what we're feeling. Mm -hmm. And you look at a song like um, Walk Around God's Heaven, right? You think about <laughs> how it seems ridiculously elementary to say, I got shoes, you got shoes, all of God's people got shoes. <laughs> when I get to have, when I, when I get to, uh, when I get to have a walk all over God's heaven, heaven, everybody talk about heaven and going. Well, think about the context of which it was written. These are individuals who see the utility of shoes as something that God is providing for people who couldn't even get the bare necessities mm -hmm. yeah. of things that survive. And this is a song of justice, yeah. but it's also a song of praise and adoration to God saying like, thank you for giving me a pair of shoes, you know mm -hmm. what I'm saying? And so in the same sense, I think hip hop is doing, doing some same things. It's like, you know, the lyrics you hear, the songs you, 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 you uh, engage with, it may seem like, what? But, like, you were going to, I know we talked about one of the lyrics you say, um, like Kanye West consistently calls himself a genius. Yeah, I'm a genius, I'm a genius. <laughs> and one of the things I love about that is because historically, I think people of color had to fight for their place in the pecking order of the pantheon of great, uh, you know, accomplishments. Like I, and so within the, the demonstrative nature of hip hop, you have to proclaim like, look, I'm great because the world hasn't affirmed me. Hmm. Right. The well, world I hasn't gotta, told we gotta me. give full service to that lyric. I'm close to Jesus, I'm also close to genius, which I love. Great. Yeah. Yeah. And I, I, I wanted to bring this up. It's like a really interesting question. Like in Christian, in the Christian world, we're, we're really good at, at uh, foregrounding humility. 
but we're not really good at like jersey popping, basically. Like, you know, like I, I kind of was made in the image of God and I got something to offer, right? I mean, does, does, can you talk about that in your, your work? Do you engage that directly? It seems like you're trying to own it by just like g going right at it. You yeah, know? I, I just want to tell people I'm dope. Yeah. <laughs> it's like, I'm not a, look. I, uh, I, I write music and my, my music's good. <laughs> and I love Jesus. And so uh, hopefully you can reconcile the two. And so um, I'm a, <laughs> I reference Kanye a lot. And forgive me because I, he's crazy, but he's also genius. And so yeah. there's a, there's, he says something like one of my favorite things, and this is going to offend some people, but it's just, I got to say it. He's like, he was on the Dave Chappelle show and, and Dave Ch and he, they knew he was going to be special when somebody called him on the phone. And he picked up the phone and he interrupted Dave Chappelle's little session. And he was like, yeah, 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 what are you doing? He's like, I'm hanging out with Dave Chappelle and some other folks. And he's like, why? He's like, because I'm Kanye and I do dope shit. Mm -hmm. And it's like, <laughs> I feel like for me, that's like, hey, like the Lord has given me the ability to do some really creative stuff. And for me to act like, like to walk around with like this E or woe is me, like, oh, I'm not gifted. Right. I think it diminishes not only what God has given me, but it diminishes the gift of God and who he is and who I'm proclaiming the greatness mm -hmm. that is, uh, mm -hmm. you know, the it's majesty a, a, of yeah. his work. There's right? a rightful pride in yeah. there. Right, yeah, and yeah. in just the nature of hip hop, you just have to be, you have to make room for yourself. Right. You have to come in and say, look, uh, and this is where I do think, um, it, it, it's like, it's Paul and Aragopagus. It's like, hey, you guys have a lot of, things to say about the gods here, but let me tell you about, you know, the unknown God. And if you do that in some old, like, you know, timid, well, hey, folks, you know, I just, I mean, maybe? <laughs> maybe Jesus? I don't know, I mean, no, like. <laughs> so I, you know, you, you gotta be very confident. You have to be confident. Right. You just have to believe, you have to believe that, you know, what you have to say is valuable. Yeah. It's a heavy burden, I think, that gets laid on you to say, but you do know that this isn't, about you and that you're supposed, you know, that you're a worm, right? right. <laughs> but, I mean, oh, so somewhere between, you already have a pretty strong dialogue like that inside, by the way, yes. as an artist. Yeah, absolutely. <laughs> yes. uh, it's, it's already yeah. happening on a pretty yes. high level inside. Yeah. And so yes. like, you don't have yeah. to actually tell me that. I got a pretty yeah. good yeah. handle on what a worm I am, but, um, yeah. but we're, <laughs> Absolutely. We're yeah. holding those tensions that Absolutely. we are, you know, Psalm 103, that um, yeah. where our man's life is like a flower, it blooms in a field, winds blows over it, its place remembers it not, but from everlasting to everlasting, our maker sees and loves. Mm -hmm. and, and so we are holding those tensions, but the church lays on sometimes a really heavy burden on the artist. Mm -hmm. So like, yeah, don't, get um, too, don't get too full of yourself. If you, you know? don't do right. something like this at the end of what you did, then it didn't <laughs> somehow. <It's> like, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> That is so real. <laughs> well, it, it actually connects to some of the phenomenon that visual artists have often struggled and music artists is the sort of um, stranglehold that the Christian bookstore, um, not a particular brand, just that idea has, <laughs> has, <laughs> has held on what, what is art or wh who is the keeper of the orthodoxy of art making. Do you know what I mean? Like, I, 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 I have suffered under that and sort of the, yeah. the liturgy that goes with the Christian bookstore. Mm -hmm. Wow. <laughs> By the way, every, everything that is, um, you know, Kanye West and um, anything significant happening in any field today is connected. So what's happening in hip hop is connected. He, he's intentionally connecting to Picasso's, yes. you know, modernist uh, mm -hmm. movement. He's, he, I mean, absolutely in a brilliant way. Um, and, and so there, there's a lot of, you know, it has to do with the market that is set up in a certain way that ha is an old wineskin that is breaking apart right now. Right. So when you walk Madison Avenue today, you see like this shops closing left and right, because no one's going into these shops. Lord and Taylor just closed, right? Ne uh, Neiman Marcus uh, is fighting for bankruptcy. So it's not just in Christian market, it's right. the market market. Yeah. <laughs> and in that world, an artist, right, has to begin to formulate his or her own determined realm of how do I, you know, not only do what I, but make what I, you know, uh, my, art sustainable, 
but how, how do you create generative practice mm. that actually affects culture? It's, it's actually a huge opportunity right now because there's a vacuum of thinking from, from the realm of economy to the realm of politics, mm -hmm. right? Mm -hmm. Everything is kind of breaking apart. And artists are the ones that have, you know, hopefully faithfully stayed in their craft to, to despite the naysayers and including yourself, you know, dare to step into that studio or the, you know, or, or the recording studio and, and actually articulate something that is, you know, integrated um, in, in the deepest realm of your intuition. So, so that means we have a certain capital we have a certain way of providing a world this rich, diverse, pluralistic. Um, no. I, I, oh, uh, yeah, bingo. bingo yeah, card. There you go. There you go. <laughs> right. I said it. John, I, you can tweet me on that one. Um, <laughs> <laughs> I, I speak in tweets. You know. yeah. um, <laughs> Uh, but, but, you know, this pluralistic reality, and, and quite possibly today, you know, artists are the only group of people who can stay above the fray of the market system, if, if, if they can, you know, stay there. Now, typically, younger artists are driven by the market, Absolutely. so they chase after it, right? They, they go after the fashion that is here today, you know, but gone tomorrow. So, so they, they're kind of spinning around and, you know, and it's very hard for them because there's no recording labels that's going to sustain them. There's no galleries that can show their work. There's, there's no publishing firm that's going to give them a big contract, you know, when you're young. So, uh, so here, here's a place where a church can come in. Right. You know, what if a church came in and said, you know, instead of fighting culture wars, we're going to, we're going to invest 10% of Absolutely. what our budget to support artists, not just Christian artists, but artists. Right. What would happen to the world, right? So, so you can actually create an economy, which the church once did, to sustain, and not just arts, but, but, but this economy of what I call you know, gift economy that is not predicated on transaction, but it's, it's, it's about cre providing gratuitous beauty into the world. Right. A book that really helped me discover that is, and I'm, some of you probably law and economists in the room, uh, Michael Sandel's What Money Can't Buy. Mm -hmm. It was really impactful mm -hmm. for me to see because mm -hmm. his whole premise is, you know, what drives morals? Is it the market or does the moral market, mm -hmm. does morals drive the marketplace or the, the market drive? And for mm -hmm. me, after reading that book, it, made me, it challenged me, even though he's not talking about art, but I'm like, what drives my art? Mm -hmm. And it was really informative for me. Yeah, the, the other one is The Gift by Lewis Hyde. H Y D E, uh, where uh, he's a poet. He, he says, you know, the gift economy of uh, art. Uh, art is a gift, not not a commodity, ultimately. And art cannot exist if if it's taken over by a com commoditized system. Mm -hmm. So art uh, gift economy can exist without the market economy. So poets like Emily Dickinson can write poems without ever being published. Right? right, but but the market economy cannot exist without without the gift side. Yeah, well, the, yeah. and this is what got the the Christian bookstore idea. It, it there's this sort of landmark article from GQ where they did a deep dive on Christian rock uh, in the 2004, and uh, this sort of stunning quote from John Jeremiah Sullivan. Uh, so it's possible, and indeed seems likely, that Christian rock and Christian music as a musical genre the only one I can think of that has actually excellence proofed itself. <laughs> and it, <laughs> basically he was challenging the idea that, oh, you like Blink-182, well, we'll give you, you know, that sound but with wholesome yeah. lyrics. So, so it seems like to me when you, in, when you say the church should invest in art, it should not find, it, it should look for weird things, right? <laughs> like it should, it should look for things that are strange or Maybe at not least, ask artists for outcomes. Yeah, at least this extravagance, right? At least this yeah, sense of go. grace operating in the world uh, that is free, um, that, you know, um, that artists are going after. Yeah. yeah. But yeah. you're right to say there is sort of an orthodoxy police, you mm -hmm. know, in mm -hmm. there. 
And that, that's sort of the closed nature. Walter Brueggemann talks about how poetry opens and opens and opens. Mm -hmm. And the more you sort of clarify doctrine, you're often closing and closing and closing. Mm -hmm. right. So I think an artist is often coming at things from the, this is the beginning of a conversation, you know, versus the more um, prescriptive, this mm -hmm. is the end of a conversation. But don't, don't you think it, it masquerades as orthodoxy, but it's actually commerce? Mm -hmm. Don't you think that's really what's going on? Exactly. I mean, yeah. yeah. Exactly. Yeah. yeah. And I also feel like we'll never we'll never get to the place where you know Marco talks about where the church can actually patronize artists in, unless artists stay faithful to the church, mm -hmm. unless we find yes. artists that are that are gonna that are gonna be elders in right. churches. Because right. then if that's right. Otherwise, we're just leaving mm -hmm. the credentials to people who've never vocationally worked in the marketplace. Yeah. Right? Like people who yeah. spent their time in seminary and. And, um, and, and spent 10 hours a day, you know, exegeting the text and, mm -hmm. you know, not to be crude, but, you know, they don't really know art. Mm -hmm. right. And so as a, as a default, they tap into this article and say, they proof text, they proof uh, by saying, well, what's great? Well, let's, let's just make the equivalent to Little Wayne and just put that out there mm -hmm. for kids. And so that's, that's literally what Christian, Christian music <laughs> has done Mm -hmm. for decades. It's just mm -hmm. like, what's, what's the wave? Let's mm -hmm. figure out how to emulate that, but just mm -hmm. put Jesus on it. Yeah. Do you, so, do you get that pressure? Do you get people saying, we'd love like, you know, this guy, but you know, with the gospel. In not it. only in the mainstream, <laughs> but even cannibalizing within the Christian space. It's like, mm -hmm. when I left the, when I, used, I used to be a part of a, a label with Lecrae. And so when I left that label, everybody, you, I had a call from every major label like, hey, let's sit down. Because they were like, they just basically wanted to make me into the next Lecrae. Hmm. And I'm just like, I'm not, I left because I'm not him. <laughs> <laughs> and so what you got to understand is you're, you can't recapitulate that. Mm -hmm. Like that's, yeah. the Lord has created that individual to be who he is. And hmm. I think we're always just looking how to create the market is like, how do we capitalize off of what's hot so that we can bring more people to our services, more people to our, mm -hmm. our conferences, yeah. and we're, we're marginalizing great artists mm -hmm. through, you know, mm -hmm. the extravagant, the weird, mm -hmm. and because they don't look like fill in the blank, you know? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. I remember years ago, Jan Chris, a singer-songwriter from Wisconsin, told me that in her very early days, she had been with a Christian label and then had gone into just more like folk music. And she said that she had been, had pressure to say Jesus more often or to, you know, mm -hmm. more Jesus per minutes or whatever. Mm -hmm. And she told them, I will not take the Lord's name in vain. And that <laughs> stuck with me. Yeah. That really stuck with me that that's a, if, mm -hmm. if you are somehow not being true to this, you know, yeah, absolutely. the authenticity that's, of what yeah. you've been called to do and right. just kind of adding those things in mm -hmm. for mm -hmm. commerce or whatever. You talked about, I think conference culture drives so much of this, Absolutely. you know, mm -hmm. um, right. it, that's right. a... What, what do you mean by that? Like the driving of having people to fill these spots to do the, the gospel work? I mean, stuff like Carver Projects. Right. Oh. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. Touché. Exactly. <laughs> Well, you know, you know, I'm wrestling it out right now because that's where, you know, yeah. I've lived. Well, there's, where there's I've a been. market. Yeah. And, and, and I'm yeah. working through that right now. But, but there is like there's a there's a feel and a look to conference culture and there's a sort yes. of thing. And what am I afraid? If I'm afraid to say something, it's often because, ooh, I wouldn't want to Offense eliminate and, myself yeah. or take myself out of out of, yeah. you know, yeah. sort of being able to engage with what I would call conference culture. This is all brand new language for me that I'm just now finding and trying to figure out myself. Yeah. But to, how to both be and we talked about this backstage, but to, to reconcile like, well, these are my people. This is where yeah. I came up. I understand what you're saying, um, but I mm -hmm. am also trying to push back and to tell you that I've seen some things and can mm -hmm. I talk to you about that and um, and so but having those lines where you feel like you're going to be sort of excommunicated now mm -hmm. um, that's that's hard that's that's sad mm -hmm. to me that that um, and I think a lot of it is commerce driven around mm -hmm. that right. kind mm -hmm. of conference culture mm -hmm. right mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. well if you want proof of our our goodwill we're losing money at the Carver Project <laughs> so <laughs> It can't be bad to gather and talk, That's you know, right. but yeah, yeah. yeah. not to. We're, we'll be sponsored by Nike next year, but. <laughs> uh, I think we have some questions, some Q&A uh, floating out there, perhaps. Well, let me, let me just, um, if, if I may, um, go back to the I Am conference that you, you, you were at. And, um, you know, we had a young playwright who just wrote this play uh, at Yale. Uh, she was a student. Uh, 
you know, at NYU, and then she went to Yale, and she wrote this play about plights of women in Africa. Um, um, never been staged before. We put it on stage. Um, it, it was terrifically moving play, and her name was Danai Gurira, you know, who, who, is, who is now the, you know, Black Panther <laughs> princess warrior. And um, we had Tony Hale in the audience. We had all these young talents that were, you know, maybe about to be launched into their careers. Um, but, you know, to, to have had that gathering, which was we lost money, and you know it was, wasn't <laughs> meant to be an industry thing. It wasn't meant to be a Christian conference circuit. It was the opposite of that, really. Um, it, it produced so much fruit, right? right? And we need to realize that if we just let go of these, you know, expectations of overprogrammed, you know, <laughs> uh, utility mm. of the church. Uh, to let people be who they are uh, in the midst of a community and accountability, surely, but um, that we, we can simply be children of God, being, you know, uh, allowed to be ourselves, um, then, then I, th I think you, you will launch more people like Danai and, you know, um, and allow, you know, that they will go into the world, be successful, they, they will be salt and light, um, and, and, you know, and, and that's just the tip of the iceberg, you know, there are probably thousands of people underneath that that, that, that can, you know, and, and so, so you and I were talking about how in the 90s in New York City it felt so isolated uh, to, to even say I'm a Christian, you know. Now it's different, you know, and, and the church is def uh, different, the world is different. And so we, we've seen in the span of 10 years this terrific shift in culture where we can sit, sit here, three of us, and talk about all of this um, and, and you interviewing us. I mean, this, this, is, this is like, it seems, you know, looking back to the 90s where we, were, we first <laughs> met, it seems like a complete, you know, uh, overhaul of, mm -hmm. of uh, this conversation about faith and culture. Um, and, and to be able to talk about the crisis that we're going through as culture, the, the, the divisiveness and polarity uh, to how to wade into that, even to ask that question and to have three artists come up and talk, or four, is, it seems incredible to me. Mm -hmm. it, it, it was inconceivable mm -hmm. in the 90s. Mm -hmm. Right. Well, one of the, right. it's interesting, one of the questions we got here was, um, do you identify as an explicitly Christian artist? Mm -hmm. You know, why, why or why not? Is it, should I, that I, be a sort of modifier on your art that you should you I know, hate cling that to? Label, so. <laughs> so I hate that label. So, you know, people ask me, so it's wonderful to have a Christian artist finally, you know, be, succeed. And I say, I'm not a Christian artist. And they say, what? You, you, like, like you, you talk about Jesus and, yeah, I talk about Jesus. I, I'm an artist who's a Christian. I, I, I don't like to use the word Christian as an adjective. Mm. It, it, that's, you know, I, I am a photo of Christ, yes. Absolutely. Everybody knows that, but, you know, I, I'm not a Christian artist. I fault, yeah. Yeah. Ditto. I, um, <clears throat> I uh, like to think, uh, one, I recognize that people are going to call you what they want to call you. Yeah. Right? Uh, 2012, I had a song called Jim Crow, hmm. and on that song, uh, the lyrics, the hook says, so I, I'm stuck here on nigger island, where niggas be wildin', where color is violence, moment of silence. Hmm. And it's just talking about the effects of Jim Crow and colorism and hmm. racial oppression and injustice throughout the song. And I'm like, you can... And, I, and let's say on the same album, I have another song called Nicodemus, and it's a worship. It's very worthy. You could play it on any of your CCM. I'm like, <laughs> I'm like, okay, well, if you're going to call me a Christian artist when I make Nicodemus, call me a Christian artist when I'm saying Nigga Island. Mm -hmm. So, but they can't do, they won't do that. So we compartmentalize what we see as Christian art. And that's the reason why I think... Um, Labeling is, is, is troubling, and it comes, it, there has, there's a whole lot of trappings that come along with that mm -hmm. that I think are very dangerous and unfair for the artist. And so I am not, 
I'm not a fan of it. I've been asked that question enough to not feel like, I recognize this, I won't say it's an ignorant question, because I recognize that there's a reason why people have that question. We want champions. We want, yes. we yes. want champions, that's and that's true. part of the struggle, and that's part of the tension. Mm -hmm. um, it's that thing we do with celebrities where absolutely. you're like, did, did you hear about uh, Arnold Schwarzenegger? He's a, he's a Christian, yeah. you know? And it's like, oh, oh, great. Absolutely. What do I do with that now? Exactly. Exactly. Man, it'd be amazing if Eminem comes to faith because then my friends would really love Jesus. Right. <laughs> no, your friends are going to be like, well, Eminem is lame now. Mm -hmm. And so... <laughs> So yeah, it's, 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 I think the moment we, we, we stop putting those labels on folks, we'll see more C.S. Lewis, we'll see more tokens, mm -hmm. we'll see more Fan, Fanny, Flannery O'Connors, and mm -hmm. we'll see more people who um, will, will take the risk of saying, I wanna be more bold in the creating of the things that I think the world needs to hear without filling the label. And I love what Flannery O'Connor talks about how and I think this is a, an epidemic in Christian create, the, the market, Christian market music, uh, making uh, mm -hmm. industry is that we make sin so cheap that grace looks cheap as well. Mm -hmm. right. Right. And so yeah. when mm -hmm. you get those kind of labels, you've already slapped parameters on me as an artist and saying, here's the things mm -hmm. that you can and you cannot talk about. Mm -hmm. And yep. so you get you end up getting kicked out of a lifeway because of the, the music you make. Yeah. <laughs> just as an example, just right. right. Yeah. Hypothetically. Yeah. Hypothetically. <laughs> Hypothetically. Charlie used to say, "God is the ocean, and we keep writing about a cup of water over mm -hmm. and over again." Oh, like, come on, right. So, yeah. how, like, yeah. I think of that every time this I sit down to write. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. If yeah, I want right. to write about the ocean, I want to write. Yeah, just the. Mm -hmm the whole mm -hmm. thing and to be that kind of artist. I've had all kinds of uh, identity crisis ar around that, you know, because I also write songs that end up sounding mm -hmm. like, kind of like hymns, like you said. Yeah, I mm -hmm. had the, both the kind of, as I'm reflecting on it, uh, things that seem more explicit come out and things that, that are, um, mm -hmm. But as an artist, there's also this thing like, you don't tell me what to do. Like, you, as soon as you try to box me, I'm gonna do, you know, I'm gonna zig when you zag. You know, yeah. there's a sense of the, the rebellious nature of an artist to just kind of <laughs> do true. that anyway. But I also <laughs> feel true. like yeah. it's perfectly fine for there to be artists who explicitly make music for oh, the yes. church. Yeah. Yeah, and I think those individuals yeah. should feel the liberty and the yes. freedom of saying, yes, I'm a Christian yeah. artist, and I'm making music explicitly for the church, for the purposes mm -hmm. of congregational worship, et cetera, et cetera. It's the problem with, the problem comes with, we, we just label that on all artists, right? Any artist who want, even especially the artists who want to be removed from that, that's yeah. where it's like, let, let those folks be liberated. And, right. But I'll say this, those artists also have to be content with the church not patronizing them in the way, mm -hmm. the market, the Christian mm -hmm. market not patronizing mm -hmm. them in the way that they would a, a artist who's comfortable with embracing that label. Right. Yeah. 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 Well, this is an interesting um, sort of thread we have not um, touched on. Show, in your album, The Narrative, you say, in my hood, it's almost innate to feel hopeless. So how do we as artists bring art, which has been traditionally connected to, to wealth and to elite status or to a, a particular set of society, how do we bring art uh, to these spaces that maybe don't have it or, or, or people that get left out of art experiences? How do we, so, so just how do we bring art to? Well, I think do we have a responsibility to maybe fight against some of the elitism that tends to happen in, in a world of art making where? Oh yeah, I don't know. think it's just art making. I think it's the <laughs> vocational ministry, the whole language around vocation, work, and economics that's mm -hmm. popping off in theological circles. Hmm. I think it's very elitist. Mm -hmm. I think when we talk about calling, it's often a privileged conversation. It's like, yeah, just what are you good at? And hmm. to do that. Right. And it's like some people work out of necessity. Some people, yeah. mm -hmm. and so very seldomly, and I'm, I'm not a theologian or a preacher, but I'm about to act like one right now. <laughs> um, very seldomly do I see in the scriptures where people have the liberty to do what they want to do. Mm -hmm. right? mm -hmm. Where they're just like, well, I'm just talented at this, and so this is what I'm going to do. I see it in the inverse. I see it where God is called. There's a need. God says, hey, I have a need over here. I'm going to need you to handle that. Mm -hmm. And they're like, oh, I don't think I'm equipped to do that. <laughs> <laughs> Almost everyone. And yeah, God yeah. is like, I didn't really ask you that. I didn't ask yeah. you. Yeah. 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 And so mm -hmm. then the job of the 
you know, for us, even in the artist community, is, is like, is there a need? Mm -hmm. Not like what, you know, not, because I feel like oftentimes we chase what is, what is you know, the, right, the, the carrot. And so in my community, is there a need for beautiful art? Like one of my, my wife is a, uh, is, a, is a visual artist as well. Yeah. One of the things that she gets commissions to do a lot is murals around mm. the community. Mm. And she's just like, not only do I think it's beautifying the city, but I'm giving kids Mm -hmm. uh, an opportunity to see, like, to imagine something yes. differently mm -hmm. on these bland, ugly walls mm -hmm. that are, mm -hmm. you know, um, or even giving, you know, uh, tag graffiti artists a, a different um, uh, imagination as well. And I love graffiti. I mean, there's some graffiti that I think is terrible and, <laughs> and, and ugly, but I, I do think sometimes we, we as artists, we, we can be uh, distracted by the, by the elitism of the market and chasing things that aren't necessarily needed. Right. And I would love for us to see uh, what can bring hope and how do we, how, how can we bring, yeah. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And it seems like community spaces like Our House North is a, is a way to make it an open door policy that mm -hmm. this is a place where you're welcome to come and make and we're gonna engage you. Yes, yes, and just to kind of roll in the artists like they're they're kind of wired differently, and so to try to make spaces where that mm -hmm. that person that maybe just isn't gonna <laughs> see it or feel it the same way, you know, can come and talk about that and and right. um, and figure. One of our our my favorite events that we do is just it's called Artist Respond. So talking about all these um, issues, but from instead of like not I'm I like down on conferences, down on the, this, but, <laughs> but to, to present any whatever we're presenting or talking about through the arts because it's that you you know it's not prescriptive and it has that you know so we're attempting to do that our first one was after Sandy Hook and we, we just needed space to grieve and invited a, a cellist a, a friend who's a poet a friend in the, in theater a songwriter and a dancer to come and gave them zero parameter just said respond to tragedy that was mm, respond yeah, to this yeah. that was our inaugural one and since then we've had around really hard topics but again just trying to awaken kingdom imagination around mm -hmm. this and that and when you have um, someone talking about our re most recent one was creation care and it was mm -hmm. a friend of ours in the Twin Cities who's a visual artist and she's doing a series called wrapped where she's drawing all these ex uh, endangered species, mm -hmm. but she write, draws them in such a way it looks like bandages wrapped and at their feet they're beginning to unravel. Mm -hmm. It's very evocative, it's, a, it's an emotional mm -hmm. experience to see these pieces. So it's coming in that, that door instead of, you know, coming through the, the debate door, like you mm -hmm. said, or like this mm -hmm. sort of mm -hmm. having a different presence in the community to consider mm -hmm. those, those things. Mm -hmm. and, and hopefully in that way, bring hope of, uh, you know, all things being reconciled, the intended yeah. nature of things, yeah. Yeah, well, Mako, you have a term where you talk about the artists are often border stalkers, the, mm -hmm. from the Beowulf yeah, reference, yeah. Yeah. that where the people on the, on the edges that, that yes. float yes. in and out between spaces, and it seems like, you know, that's what, that's how you, that's how you welcome an artist into a church that maybe doesn't feel comfortable there, that it always has been on the right. edges. Right, and artists uh, instinctively it can go in any, area of society. They, they, they are with the poor mm -hmm. and they can go, you know, hang around with the kings. And that's very unique. You're, I mean, we, we, we get to go to all sorts of places and, um, and, and I think that's part of God's calling, uh, creative border stalkers, or whatever you want to call it, to really harness and be a bridge maker between different tribes, um, different class levels, um, you know, it's interesting that people want to, you know, lift these gifted voices into the privileged place as if to own them. But ultimately, the artist says, no, I, I'm not owned by this, you know, mm -hmm. um, and they will simply trans transgress in, in some sense to get back to their, um, first love, you know, mm -hmm. and, and I, so, so I, I think that process is very important. Um, the market says, you know, we have to raise their, you know, market and brand and so forth, but uh, really that um, ultimately dehumanizes um, everyone in the process. 
think about the space that you created post 9/11. Mm -hmm. Oh right, yeah, yeah. I mean, yeah. That's exactly. That's right, what and that was doing. yeah. Post 9/11, I was I had a studio in Ground Zero area, so we we simply we call it a, a tea house, an oasis in Ground Zero, and just invited artists to. First of all, just have tea, and then it turned into a series of exhibits because we're artists and we, we weren't having exhibits elsewhere. So it's, we're like getting together, and, and there were, um, it's called Tribeca Temporary. Uh, you, you can go to tribecatemporary.com and still see th these works. But I mean, these, these artists, once again, just like the conference, many of them are non believers. Um, and, you know, even though it wasn't a church thing, um, many of them um, entered into, let's say, a conversation with spirituality that they didn't have before. Um, two other musicians, the music that was composed in the space around that time are now the signature pieces for post night of music. Uh, one artist who passed away uh, soon after. What she presented at that space was the last piece she did mm -hmm. on the side of eternity. And recently she had a huge retrospective in New York and those pieces that, you know, my son and I carried from Southeast Street Seaport in the wind, they were really delicate butterflies into the Tribeca space. Mm -hmm were, you know, like in, in this display case, you know, in a, like a museum space. And um, so I think that kind of, you never know what kind of influence you give when you just gratuitously invite artists to participate out of, out of loss, out of need, out of pain. Um, and I, I, I can remember, I can tell you for sure, none of these artists were wealthy or you know, privileged. They, they, mm -hmm. they were there because they, they, they wanted to create and, um, um, and then they, they, they had, um, they, they were longing for community that, that would tell them, you know, your, your gift can be liberated, you know, that, that it, it, it has a purpose in, under God's you know, love, and, and I, th I think so th that, that's how culture care or culture renewal can happen is, is when, um, when, when we step into, uh, you know, this, this ground zero condition mm -hmm. and, and floodplains and, and be able to generate something, you mm -hmm. know, just simply by hosting, yeah. Well, our, our time is uh, drawing to a close here, but we have time for um, a final sort of question. Um, and so as we think about this conversation, I'd love to hear uh, what advice you have for young artists, um, or maybe perhaps people who are not artists. There's probably a lot of non-artists in the room. What, what, what would you tell them? Uh, what can they do to help? What can they do to support uh, a young, young hip-hop artist? What, what advice would you give them? Hmm. <laughs> um, oh man, I don't know. Uh, it depends on what day of the week it is. Because sometimes I want to tell people don't do it, <laughs> and then there's other days where I'm like, man, just you know, uh, do do it and don't have a backup plan and just mm -hmm. just go <laughs> achieve your goals and go for it and go. Yeah, I don't, you know, because there's. It's, art is a, um, it, it, you know, I asked them questions. So one of the questions I would ask is, what, where do you see your, so I, had, I remember a professor asked me this question. She was, you know, think of some people that you, that you see where they are and who are those people and how did they get there? And, you know, where would you see yourself in 10 years if, if you were to be a hip hop artist? And then work your way to that is what I would say. It sounds really simple, mm -hmm. but, you know, you know, you, you think about an end in a sense, and you just, I guess in a sense, you work towards that, but ultimately you have to love the craft. You just yeah. have to love, and especially yes. hip hop, I think hip hop is not seen as an, an artistic craft. It's seen as something that can, anybody can do. It's seen as something that can get me rich, get me out of this predicament. And for a lot of people, it has been that, mm -hmm. and that's a good thing. And it's employed a lot of people. It's 
It's created many and many a jobs and uh, for individuals that come from certain communities that I think is amazing. However, um, I would love the day when I see hip hop actually like hip hop taught in music theory classes and mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. hip hop. It's a, it's a craft that requires something of you and you yeah, have exactly. to sacrifice to, to, to earn it. Yeah. And uh, study great artists, mm -hmm. you know, like you would, mm -hmm. you know, study musicians, like mm -hmm. you would study painters. Mm -hmm dancers, you know, study great artists, um, you know, still in a way that's ethical, <laughs> I guess you can say, like just mimic, but make it your own. Mm -hmm. And um, yeah, just fall in love with, but also there's a, there's a piece that is like, how, how can I be original? And going back to what I previously said about looking for the need and um, being aware of a need and being authentic and creating music in that space and not forcing it, like, yeah. you know what I mean? But like just allowing the Lord to, to speak to you in, in a way that's genuine and using you in a way that's genuine. Um, but a lot of people I would also say don't do it. So, mm. <laughs> I know that sounds terrible, but. No, it's good. It's like, good yeah, it's, 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 well, it it's depends hard. on what we're talking about because, right. um, you know, it could be, it's, I, you know, I have often people come and say, can I, can I come here? I'm not an artist. Can I come to the art mm. house, you know? Mm. And I tell them, I was in fellowship of Christian athletes. So, <laughs> <laughs> yes, mm. you can. It's artists in the broadest sense. But I find myself here as I'm aging um, and I'm often uh, working. I do some songwriter workshops and things like that. And it brings a broad range of people who are vocationally uh, gifted and are going to go do it, you know, and then others who probably won't do it vocationally, like you said, just like maybe don't, you're not going to fight that battle in particular, but there, but I find myself really, you said it earlier, um, mm -hmm. that it didn't just apply to the arts, it actually, it was, yeah, we were talking about, about the gospel, gospel. Yes. and I feel like there's an element of, of this that is, um, it's important that we all are like, uh, it matters, you know, so when I'm talking with a lot of young artists now, regardless of kind of where they are, where I think they might land in the marketplace mm -hmm. or not, um, to say it, it matters that you attempt to do that, you know, mm -hmm. I want to try to make a chair and I want to try to, mm -hmm. you know, paint. I'm mm -hmm. not good at mm -hmm. painting, but I want to try yeah. to do these things and I think you should try to write a song and do these things. Mm -hmm. So I know I'm coming at it from a different perspective mm -hmm. of like uh, an artist that's genuinely maybe trying to get into the, the marketplace, but I think it's important that um, that that sort of, it's, it's valuable in and of itself because it teaches us things. The art is actually teaching us things about extravagance and wastefulness and yeah. uh, that we're entering mm -hmm. into those things. So that's just where I find myself right now. I'm encouraging a lot of, a lot of people come to my songwriting events that they wrote music in college and then they were known for that then. They were mm -hmm. like the girl that writes songs yeah. or whatever yeah. and that was a big part of their identity in life. Yeah then life kind of took them on this mm. journey. And now mm. they're just trying to rediscover or recapture this part mm. of themselves. And in, in that scenario, you know. Well, and making art and making money from art are different things. That's, like, those are different things, yeah, yeah. Right. So, but yeah. Different yeah. Things. So those are kind of, I I'm, I'm have both of those answers popping up in my head. My practical answer to someone who is vocationally moving into the arts or is maybe will be making music for a living. Um, is what you said as well, but just I think exemplar is so important in who you're, to have these people that when you just think of them, it sort of, it, it, it gives you that adjustment or that reframing that you, um, and so like what, take in a lot of information and, and then, you know, it'll, I said this earlier as well, but, uh, um, oh, come on. Who am I? Bob Dylan. Bob Dylan. Thank you. <laughs> Sorry. Yeah, exactly. Kind of an indie yes. artist. Uh, yeah. yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I, know. I had a, I had just a sweaty guy running around looking for a file there for a second. Um, <laughs> uh, <laughs> that happens. That happens. Yeah, happens, happens a lot. Lot. <laughs> a lot. <laughs> um, Bob Dylan said to your <laughs> remark about stealing that um, it's it's arrogance to think that we ever create something yes, new, genuinely right. new. We're that's all right. kind of we're all stealing, stealing and reassembling yeah, things, right. and then. Absolutely. But I'm uniquely, um, you know, I said my dad liked BB King, my mom Barbara Streisand, so I'm the unique configuration of influences. You know, you are unique, and so um, so it matters that we continue again, kind of the flower and the uh, yeah. infinite value, mm -hmm. those types of of. It matters, and, and um, anyway, 
What was I saying? <laughs> Bob Dylan. It was good though. Bob it Dylan. Was good. Bob Dylan. Bob. Bob. Yeah, just to, just to to to, to uh, self correct. I would for people who are trying to go into the vocational. Yeah. I would, that's what I was like. Probably don't do it. Because mm -hmm. that's because it's not all it's cracked up to yeah, be. Yeah, you can still make things. Right. You can enjoy making right. and not have the burden of this has to be my single source of income or right. I am not valid as an artist. Right. That, that, yeah. is, that is a false narrative. Yeah, yeah. yeah let, let all that happen, whatever it is, but right. keep, keep engaging, yeah. Yeah, that's right. You, Mago, you have any advice for young visual artists? Or? Well, um, so what I, what I would say is everybody's a maker in this room. Um, God is the maker. None of us are really artists. God is the artist. Right? Everybody's life is a song that God is singing over us. And yet we have refused to think of this as the main identity of the church in 20th century. So we have made the church into this mechanism of industrial mechanism of multiplication by numbers and um, make, you know, turning malls into churches and um, auditoriums and um, football stadiums into churches. I'm not saying that those things were wrong, I, but I think we, I envision a time when every church becomes a maker's, maker's space. Uh, every church becomes a studio. Every church becomes a dance, um, dance hall. Every church becomes a place of where writers can find their resources and music can, new music can come out again. And, and, and I, I, don't, I don't think this is a far off dream. I, I think it's already happening. Uh, the younger generation is starting to understand that they are makers, first of all, and their identity as people, whether Christians or not, uh, that we have to create into the world. We are always being co-opted co by the market, especially in, in our times. It's the, um, you know, it's, uh, it's the tablets, it's the smartphones, it's the you know, digitization, which, which always reduces our experience into sound bites and, you know, um, tweets. <laughs> um, and, and I think people are starting to see that they're being dehumanized uh, in some way, and they want to um, be slower and, 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 you know, grow their own vegetables and, you know, have this particular kind of coffee from, you know, fair trade. And, and, and I, think, I think those things indicate that, you know, we are recognizing that we are makers and we, we, we can really dictate how we consume things, you know, mm. and, and rather than being consumers, we can be makers. Right, and, and when you're ma making, right, so, so for young artists today, <clears throat> the opportunity is just so huge be because it used to be that if you were a young musician, you had to shoot for the top by being, you know, picked up by a label. No, you don't need to do that anymore, you know. You, you can do what you, do and but but the most important thing for sustainability of you know that let's say a career is that you build around a community around what you do and and that you create your own market system in a way that is sustainable you know it's almost like a, you know a farmers market model for the arts you know it's it's like it, it's not fancy but you know, the, all the lines go to the best, you know, uh, best um, makers, really, right? Whether it be fruit or vegetable or whatever. And, and the abundance of God is going to attract people, create community, and make the economy work. Mm -hmm. So I, I, I think this is just a way to look at the arts, not as this, you know, capitalistic system of industry, 
but as, as kind of the slow growth of community uh, farmers market, you know, that, that everybody makes something, you know, and, mm -hmm. and some people make more and some people gifted. There's going to be a long line, but, but ultimately it feeds the whole community because um, we, we are all malnourished. Mm -hmm. You know, um, we, we think we are um, taking in, you know, um, the, 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 we're surviving just barely by looking at our tablets. When we need to be listening to Sarah's house concert and, and talk, you know, listen to her story about getting through that dark time. Um, and, you know, those things, and, and by the way, hip hop, it's interesting, my, my second son is a rapper, so that we, you know. Um, hip hop is, is one of those few genres that, it, that can still morph, right? It, it, it's still undefined in, in a sense. The market defines it, but, but the communal aspect of it, because of the resilience of the margins, it, it can still be redefined once again. And to me, that's the most exciting thing about, you know, certain art forms today. It's because we ha the market has kind of collapsed. The genre itself can be redefined. Mm -hmm. So you can basically, if you're a young person, you can basically say, I, I think I am called to paint or write or whatever. Well, whatever your genre is, you can define that. You, you don't have to be an artist. You don't have to be a painter. You don't have to be a singer-songwriter. You can do whatever you are called to do and create a genre out of it. You know, J.R. Tolkien created a fantasy novel genre out of trauma, mm -hmm. right? So this is a moment when we, we have this moment in history where everybody has the opportunity to do that. And if you have a young person, you know, gifted, affirmed by community, I mean, it, that's a moment to really galvanize all that the community can, can offer to make sure that that person has the best chance to, to change the world, right? Mm -hmm. So, so that, those, those are really uh, thoughts that I, you know, I, 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 I would tell young artists today. Um, but the bottom line is it's really, really hard work. Mm -hmm. uh, I, I find it miraculous that I can today paint, make a living, you know, and um, that's, you know, that I don't take that ever for granted because I, 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 I know that how hard that is and how impossible that, that is and how much of a proof that God is the artist mm -hmm. yeah. because otherwise it's impossible. Well, that's going to end our uh, Carver Conversation 2019 tonight. Uh, thank you for coming. Um, let's welcome, or uh, <laughs> let's say goodbye <laughs> We're gonna do it again. to our panelists. Thank you. <laughs>